I was introduced to trauma in 1979. And a colleague of mine, a psychiatrist, wanted me to see a patient of his. And this patient had gone from doctor to doctor with all kinds of horrible symptoms, what we would now call fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome, severe premenstrual syndrome, severe migraines, headaches, migraines. And she was desperate and she w went from doctor to doctor without any help. It's something that unfortunately still does happen, does occur. And so finally she was referred to, to my, my colleague, the psychiatrist. And uh, he tried to, there were, at that time there was one antidepressant and one tranquilizer. So he tried those and it made very little difference. So he asked me if I would see her. And I said, sure. Well, this, this woman called Nancy, she came in with her husband because in addition to all the physical symptoms, she had severe panic attacks and agoraphobia. She couldn't go out alone outside of her house. And you could see that they, how uncomfortable they both were. I mean, she was really in, her heart rate was about 120 beats a minute. And you could see he was so tired at being her caretaker. Well, I had her lay down on the, the couch there. And I started to do some uh, relaxation of her neck muscles. And lo and behold, her heart rate started to go down and went down to normal range, maybe a little bit lower, and then immediately shot up again to about 140, 100. And even as I tell you the story, right, because this is something that happened how many years ago? You know, uh, 69, what was that? Like, 40 plus years ago, I still feel that tightening in my chest. Right? So I said probably the stupidest thing you could say. I said, Nancy, relax. You must relax. However, her heart rate started going down and I had a, a relief, a sigh of relief, but it went down and down and down below normal, below 70 in the 60s and even in the 50s and she turned pale and she looked at me and she said, doctor, doctor, I'm dying. Don't let me die. Help me, help me. Again, <laughs> now I feel a little bit of a twisting in my gut as well as a tightness of the chest. <laughs> but I noticed that it just moves through, which is an important aspect of the treatment, uh, the approach that I developed. I, Without quite knowing why, I saw the image at the, at, the, at the far wall of a tiger, hence the title of my first book, Waking the Tiger. And I said, Nancy, there's a tiger. Run, climb those rocks and escape. To both of our amazement, her body started to shake and tremble and her legs started moving as though they were running. And this went on for 30, 40 minutes. There would be waves of trembling. Her hands would turn ice cold and then warm. Uh, her body would, would shake and, and, and tremble and she would feel tremendous amounts of tingling and what she s described as energy. And as this continued, she would take deep, spontaneous breaths. And this is not a breath that you can say, okay, take, take a deep breath. It just came from her whole being, her whole organism. And she became more and more settled. Finally, about 40 minutes, she opened her eyes, looked at me, and she said, Doctor, do you want me to tell you what happened? Of course, well, of course, I know this method. I developed this. Yes, please, I would be interested in uh, and she said, when I was terrified, I thought I was going to die. I really, really thought I was going to die. But when you told me to see that picture, I became more frightened. But when I felt myself running and felt myself climbing the rocks, I felt the most powerful I can ever remember. And when I got to the top, 
I sat there and I looked down at the tiger and a picture came to me when I was four years old. I had a, a, a tonsillectomy with ether, which was at those times was used very, very commonly. And very often the children were terrorized, completely terrorized, and held down till they couldn't move. And so he or she had been held down, immobilized by the doctors and nurses. And for 20 years, she still remained frozen in that terror state. And when she entered graduate school, which she was, she was uh, going for a PhD in physiology at Berkeley, the strain of that and a new relationship really kind of broke down her ability to adapt and she was overtaken by this anxiety. But by being able to do what she couldn't do then, to have an experience which actively opposed, which contradicted her experience of helplessness, of being held down, of not being able to run, physiologically, that this changed literally that was the last panic attack she had had. We did several more sessions and her physical symptoms went way, way down. Um, and in uh, and, and a five-year follow-up, she had no symptoms at all. She had completed her doctorate and was off to a, uh, to a teaching research post at, a, at, a, at another university. Well, obviously, as a scientist, I had to investigate this. Of course. So I was hooked, you could say. That was trauma grabbing me. And two things. Clinically, of course, I realized that although the term wasn't used because the term trauma really, it was still 12, 13 years before that, that uh, term would even be in, 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 in use uh, as PTSD in the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual. And um, so I realized that I could have re-traumatized her if I hadn't seen this image, if, I ha if our timing hadn't been perfect. You know, who knows what have, would have happened. So I started to develop a methodology that worked with these experiences one small piece at a time, what I call titration, so that the risk of being overwhelmed, you see, because the nervous system, if the nervous system experiences overwhelm, it doesn't distinguish that from the original trauma. Mm -hmm. And so the nervous system really can't tell the difference. So that was a really important feature in terms of the clinical.